Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us on the third and last day of the Zygmunt Calderon lectures. Uh, following up on, on the last two lectures, Camilla will talk about center manifolds today, um, as far as I know. <laughs> If he hasn't changed plans. Um... No, no, I haven't changed plan. And I actually uh, thank you guys for staying with me up until the very end. So, um, 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 OK, so very well, let me go back to um, our um, like, like sample problem that we uh, isolated in the last lecture. So I have a, um, um, uh, oh, what happened? Um, this one was not planned. Okay, so I have this uh, integral carbon T, which is area minimizing. Okay, and um, um, of dimension, say M, and of um, co dimension, bigger or equal than two. And what I want to show you is that um, um, so there are now so there are few um, flat singular points. Okay, and 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 uh, now a flat singular point is a point where when I rescale, I see a tangent plane with an integer multiplicity, which uh, we will call Q, right? So I can actually. Like I can introduce a notation for the ones which um, um, so which are indexed with this Q. So F Q is going to be like you know the flat uh, singular points uh, where the multiplicity of the tangent is actually Q. Now this is slightly is slightly. Um, inaccurate because I don't know actually that there is a unique tangent cone. So I don't even know that if one tangent cone is a flat plane, all of them have to be flat planes. So I should really say uh, where the multiplicity of a tangent plane is Q, but let me just say the flat tangent is Q. Okay, and what I want to show you is that there are not too many of this FQ. Right, and and you see that I can sort of try to induct on Q, because what I know is that F one is actually empty. So F one is equal to the empty set, and that is the Georges theorem, because I already explained when you actually have multiplicity one, then you can approximate efficiently with an, a, an harmonic function, and you have the decay. Okay, so like the first thing that you want would like to show is that F two is not too large. For instance, the dimension of F two is small enough. Okay. So, in fact, what you would like to show next is that the Hausdorff dimension of F2 is less or equal than M minus two. Okay, and what you would like to do is like, you, you would like to say, okay, let me assume not. So let me assume not, let me assume by contradiction um, that um, the M minus two plus some alpha dimensional measure of F2 is positive. Okay, so there is a, a, a standard measure theoretic device to actually show the following. If there is a set uh, with positive H M minus two plus alpha measure, there must be a lot of points in this set in which you see H M minus two plus alpha uh, a positive measure on a ball of radius R for a lot of scales which are going down. So in other words, for because of measure theory, I can fix. So, so there are lots of points um, say P in my FQ with the property that when I, uh, um, um, so with the property that there is a subsequence going to zero, uh, such that if I magnify by by uh, um, a so if I take an homotopy of um, a ratio uh, one over r k, so um, uh, there are many points p with r such that if I rescale by a factor 
one over RK around P. So I find a rescaled current. So the rescaled current, which I'm going to call, say, T, P, R, K, um, has plenty of singular points of type FQ. And what I mean by this is that if I take the HN minus 2 plus alpha measure on the ball of radius 1 intersected with, now I take the singular points of multiplicity Q, but of this rescaled current, OK? I will actually be able to bound this from below with some constant, which depends on alpha and m, OK? And which is the positive. OK. So now what you would imagine is that if I am lucky and this TPRK are converging to a flat plane, so they should converge to a flat plane of multiplicity Q. It's not strictly speaking true because I told you that there is one tangent, which is a flat plane of multiplicity Q. And one tangent means that there is some sequence of the scalings which are converging to this. And it might be actually so unlucky that the sequence of rescalings that you're picking up is different from the, from, from the sequence of rescalings, which is converging to a plane. So that is actually something that uh, uh, might be a splitting headache at the beginning. But there's a way around this. So there's a way actually of making sure that the sequence, which is going to 0, on which you see a lot of singular points, is actually the same sequence over which you know that you're converging to a flat tangent plane. OK, so once you know this, what you could imagine is that the following is that um, the current uh, 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 TPRK can be well approximated by an harmonic. So TPRK can be well approximated by an harmonic multivalued function. And we know that the number of values has to be this Q. Zero. No, no, no. Yeah, don't make numbers. Um, um, okay, so there is an harmonic Q-value function which approximate which approximates our current better and better. And what you would hope is that the singularities of this current is actually inherited by the harmonic uh, function, okay? So hope um, this function um, inherits the singularities of the rescale current. And OK, so now what you really would like to do is actually you would like to take a limit as RK goes to 0. Now, if you take a limit as RK goes to 0, you might take, say, the sequence of singular sets and take some um, um, what is called, I mean, like, and take, uh, take the Ausdorf limit. And you could hope that this Ausdorf limit is going to be the singular set of your uh, uh, um, a function uh, because, okay, so you, you're approximating better and better with, a, with an harmonic function, and then by compactness, you find actually an harmonic function in the limit. So now, if you want to do it, I mean, this is the way you really do it. And if you want to do it in this way, uh, taking the, the Hausdorff measure is not a very good idea because the Hausdorff measure is not upper semi continuous in the limit. You want to show actually that the limiting set is uh, large. Uh, so you will need, for technical reason, to actually take what is called the Hausdorff m minus 2 plus alpha infinity pre measure. Okay, but that's just a technicality because this guy is uh, upper semi continuous. Okay, so again, what you now want to show is that under this limiting procedure, the singularities survive. Okay, so you want again to uh, to uh, to uh, to prove. So, so what you what you want to prove is that singularities persist in the limit. OK, if you were able to do this, you would find a contradiction uh, because the final guy, which is actually an harmonic uh, function, 
has a large singular set. And your regularity theory is telling you that that is not possible. OK, so for instance, I told you in two dimensions, the singularities of the dear minimizers of the harmonic multivalued functions are isolated. If they are isolated, they have out of dimension zero. So they can have positive uh, Hausdorff measure for, say, some alpha uh, bigger than zero. OK, so that would be the idea. So this would give you a contradiction with the, regu with the, with the regularity theory for the linear, uh, uh, for the linear object. So it would give you contradiction to linear regularity theory. OK, so now if you remember our discussion last, um, uh, so last time, which is yesterday, this persistence of singularity is in general false. So this thing over here is not true. OK, and, 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 and you remember that I already gave this example. So I gave this example where you have um, z minus, say, some holomorphic function phi of w to the power, say, q equal w to the power p. And let me take a p, which is huge, is something like, I don't know, 1,000 q plus 1, right? Um, so that when I take the Q root, somehow the homogeneity of the singularity is 1,000, almost 1,000, whereas here I will have a lot of regular polynomials or a polynomial with a regularity which is much, much lower. So when I make a zooming, a rescaling, I will see the regular part and not the singular part, okay? So uh, yesterday in the regularity theory, so in the linear case, this phi, So phi was the average of the multifunction. And we can remember that I told you, since actually the multifunction is harmonic, it's not hard to imagine that the average is going to be, the, to be harmonic too. And if it is harmonic, it is very regular. And I can just subtract off from all sheets this, this, this function phi. Or if you want another thing, another way I could actually do it is instead of approximating uh, my, my, my current uh, with an harmonic uh, graphs over straight coordinates, I could actually take this, the graph of phi as a manifold and then approximate my, 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 my current over the normal bundle of this phi, okay? So now I am in the, in the linear case and even in the best case scenario, even if I knew that I were a multigraph, this multigraph would solve actually the minima surface equation locally where it's regular. And the sum of functions which solve the minimum surface equation is not going to solve any, uh, uh, any meaningful equation. Of course, locally, if I have solutions of the minimum surface equation and I average them, uh, their average is going to be as nice as the solution of the minimum surface equation. But the point is that um, before I knew harmonicity, the way I would prove harmonicity uh, outside of the singularities is just to say, okay, I got an harmonic function because I'm averaging harmonic functions. But across singularities, um, this would be harmonic because I, I'm going to use some, some weak uh, uh, condition for being harmonic, right? So the harmonicity would help me actually understand that the average is regular even where uh, uh, the object is singular. So now, of course, I don't have anything at this uh, at disposal in this case. Through the singularity, I might be singular because I know I'm actually a solution of the PDE only outside, okay? So now, the graph of phi, which is what you would like to con conquer. So the graph of phi, which is what you would like to conquer, uh, is what is, 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 is in this theory, in Amgren's language, uh, as what is called a center manifold. So what is this center manifold? Well, ideally, it's something which approximates the average of the sheets kind of very efficiently. At the same time, it's something that I actually want regular enough. Because the way now I want to argue is that if I take this center manifold, which is approximating the average of the sheets, I will actually approximate my current on the normal bundle of the center manifold. And so if I want somehow a normal bundle which is well behaved, I would actually at least need the center manifold to be C2, C2. Okay? So need 
C2 to approximate uh, the current um, uh, over the normal band. Okay, why would I insist actually to have the normal bundle? Well, because you see, um, in the in the in in the in the um, in the limit, what I'm actually hoping is that uh, my approximation will be uh, converging to an harmonic function. And um, when I'm actually approximating over the normal bundle, what is happening is that I have a solution of the Jacobi equation, so it will not be harmonic. But the error to be harmonic will be actually something which goes like the second fundamental form of my um, of my uh, graph of phi. Okay, so if I am C two and I'm rescaling into my singularity, so if I am C two, when I rescale, actually the second fundamental form will, will become smaller and smaller. So being a solution of the Jacobi equation will be asymptotically like being an harmonic function. So you can understand why geometrically it makes sense to approximate over the normal bound. Okay, so now the point is, how am I going to do this though? So um, this is of course uh, uh, the, like the, the most difficult part of the whole proof. And it's what, for instance, in Andrew's book uh, uh, is like almost two thirds of the entire enterprise. And, and, and in fact, this is what we can actually do apparently in a much easier way. Uh, only I can't really tell you what we do differently because I don't understand uh, uh, his 600 or 700 pages of proof in detail, I, I, I just see that there are some things which are like similar to what we do, but um, um, I can't really compare the, the hard estimates um, uh, at, at, uh, at more than a very superficial level. Okay, so how do we do this? So we do this in the following way. So we produce an approximate average Uh, with the following algorithm. So we start by taking our kind of plane, which we know approximate efficiently Oops. Okay, which I know approximates efficiently my current, and I start subdividing it into cubes. And you will see that somehow this is going to be a, a, an appropriate, um, an appropriate um, uh, ending lecture for the Zygmunt Calderon uh, 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 lecture because it's going to be a Calderon Zygmunt decomposition of the plane um, uh, according to some stopping time argument. Okay, so on each of these cubes, on top of it, I see a little bit of the current. Okay, so let me just zoom this picture over here. So this is what I see. Okay, so I take the so I take a cylinder around it and I tilt it and I tilt it by choosing the plane which approximates best my 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 surface at that level. So this is going to be so this base is going to be the best approximating disk. Okay, so over this disk, I approximate my, my current. It's actually uh, going to be a lot of sheets, right? So it's going to be something like this because my current is complicated. So I approximate over this with a multi-valued graph, okay? So here I make my multi-valued approximation. So say it's, it's, uh, it's these, um, um, it's these, um, uh, um, black surfaces. So this is the multi-valued approximation in the tilted coordinate. Okay, so now I have a multi-valued function. It's just only an approximation in measure. So it will miss my current on a set of, um, of, um, of substantial measure, but, but small measure, okay? Okay, and now I take the averages over here. So I take the averages and I produce a, a, a new function. So now I'm running out of color. Let's see if I can um, okay, let me use the, say, the green. So now here I take the average, okay? So I take the average, and I'm, I'm reading this average as a function over the cylinder. But okay, if the cylinder is not too much tilted, and if my current is somehow not too wild, so that the Lipschitz approximation is like, you know, with a small Lipschitz constant, it still gives me a graph 
over here, okay? But actually what I will do is I will not even do that. So after I have the average, so this is the average, I approximate it by convolving with a kernel, a smooth kernel phi r, where the r is essentially the size of my CD. Okay, so, and this gives me a graph. And what I want to say is that this graph is the good approximation of my, uh, of my center manifold at that scale. Okay, so then I go back to, uh, I go back to the cylinder. Okay, and I produce a function, let me call it GL. So GL is now going to be a function which goes from L, L is the cube. So this one is one cube. And it goes into, say, the uh, orthogonal of my of my plane, right? So this is a uh, phi zero plane. It's going to phi zero perm. Okay, now for each of these L's, so for for say for L one, L two, L three, I got my function. Uh, now this is a good model for my center manifold, but of course it's different from plane to plane. So what I do is I use a partition of unity, and I sum. With the partition of unity, uh, all my functions GLI. Okay, and this one is what I will call, say, GK. Uh, uh, this is what I will call GK, uh, where I'm actually using as a parameter K the size of this um, uh, of uh, of uh, of this grid. I mean, two to the minus K. Okay. Very well. So this produces a sort of average, which is a bit better than doing the average. I mean, like, of course, what I could have done is I could have made a very big approximation on the initial grid, and then I could have averaged everything on the orthogonal coordinates, I mean, on pi zero per. But this actually locally captures the geometry a little bit better because I'm tilting according to the optimal plane, according to where place I am. Okay. So now what I'm going to do, so now I'm going to look at I'm going to look at these uh, um, cubes that I had before. Okay, and they, and they compose each of them into four smaller, well, these are squares, so I decompose them into four smaller squares. Uh, but I decompose them into four smaller squares only if something happens. So I, I, I keep decomposing as long as my current stays in average very flat. So I decompose square uh, for which in the um, related cylinder, so let me call this cylinder like CL. So in the related cylinder, the current keeps being very flat. So very flat, if you go back to what I defined as the excess uh, uh, in the last lecture, so the difference between how much mass I have in the cylinder and how big is actually uh, Q times the base of the cylinder, right? which is giving you a measure of, say, how big is the W12 norm of my function, essentially. So if, if this keeps being small, and if they, if 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 the sheets that I get from the harmonic approximation keep being relatively close, I mean, like if I am actually relatively flat, but I I find a couple of sheets which are actually far away, then I will stop my refining procedure. Okay, and the sheets of the approximation are are relatively close. Okay, otherwise I actually don't refine, right? So I will only refine on some subcubes where one of these two stopping conditions fail. Or if you want, the stopping condition is the reverse. So I stop when the excess is considerably larger than uh, the size of the cylinder. So I'm not anymore that flat. 
or I stop if the sheets have become further apart. Okay, and then I do all I was doing before, but uh, instead of doing all I was doing before on, on, on squares of the same size, I only do it on the squares of the old size, which were undecomposed, and I knew it on the new, on the new squares, which I get from the decomposition. Okay, so I, I, I run the same, uh, um, I run the same uh, algorithm, And now I produce GK plus one. Okay, and of course this GK plus one now is going to be more complicated because it's a partition of unity of squares of a different size. Okay, so now I keep doing this, uh, but I keep doing this only on cubes. I mean, now, now I, I again refine, but I add actually a third condition. I'm certainly not going to refine cubes, which are, cu which are close to cubes, which were not refined. So this one over here, will not be refined. Because it's just close to another cube, which has not been refined at the previous step, right? So now I run the same thing. And you know, some of them will be refined, and some of them will not be refined. Okay, and this produces gk plus one. And, and then I keep going. And my center manifold is going to be the graph of the limit. And of course, now this, this function is going to be like related to a, a calderon zygmunt decomposition of my uh, domain in which I have some points where I actually never stop, possibly. So I have a closed set of points where this refinement procedure never stops. And then I have actually cubes at which I have stopped. So the refining procedure where I never stopped, essentially my current is going to be squashed onto uh, uh, onto this uh, graph of this function, right? So because at every scale around those points, I keep being flatter and flatter, and I keep being closer and closer with the sheets, okay? So now on all the other cubes, actually, at a certain scale, I either separate or I am not that flat anymore, and that is the scale at which I stop. Okay, modulo that there is this third category of cubes where I have stopped because a ne nearby cube has stopped, okay? So those cubes, might be good at that scale, but there is actually some nearby cube, uh, which is you know, not too far away and, of a, and, and, and bigger than they are, over which actually I'm not too flat and, and, and or I'm, I'm, I'm not too close in the sheets, okay? So now this procedure, and this is like, you know, one of the hardest, one of the hardest part, maybe the hardest part. So this procedure GK actually converges to a function, a final function G, which in fact is C3 alpha for some positive alpha. So remember that I told you that I need C2. But it actually turns out along, I mean, if you look at some nasty details of the proof on what is going on, there are some estimates later on in which the C2 is actually not enough and in which C3 enters. And the reason is that when I'm proving some monotonicity formula of this frequency function, that will be actually inside the gradient of the uh, mean curvature of the center manifold. I'm not sure how relevant that is. I mean, I, uh, I mean, since you have C3 estimates and we never were in a condition to, uh, to need actually to go to C2, I'm not sure whether it is really needed. I mean, that maybe there's a way around that. I mean, certainly you can make sense of the uh, integral quantities that you want, even if actually, uh, that is this gradient of the mean curvature. And, and, and uh, what you need to do maybe is just to estimate in some negative sobolet space. But, 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 but anyway, so this is what is going to happen. So you have C3 alpha estimates, and this is like the hardest part. And the reason, so the reason why this is true, um, ultimately is the following. The reason is, and I told you like uh, a couple of, um, uh, maybe I told it actually, uh, I told you actually last, um, last um, in the last lecture. So the reason is that the Taylor expansion of the area functional is one plus modulus of gradient of u squared plus terms 
which are of type gradient of u to the power four. So this has a very interesting effect. So the interesting effect that it has is that if I give you a solution of the minimum surface equation, and I look at the point where gradient of u is equal to zero. So if u solves the minimum surface equation, and gradient of u is equal to zero, let's say at the point zero, the fact that this Taylor expansion does not have the third term actually tells you that the second and third order polynomial in the Taylor expansion at zero are harmonic. Now, if you remember our smoothing procedure, right? So what I told you is that I take the average of the sheets, which are sum of solutions of the minimum surface equation in an ideal situation, and I convolve them by this regularization here, right? So I make this convolution with the curve. So take phi radio, And what you very well know is that, well, if this average that you're actually, uh, uh, of which you're computing the average, right, has a Taylor expansion, which at, I mean, second order polynomial is harmonic and third order polynomial is harmonic. When I'm actually taking the convolution with a radial kernel, they are not changing because if I take a, an harmonic function and I convolve with, um, with the radial kernel, I'm not changing what is happening. So now, since I'm actually approximating my current on the system of coordinates, which is tilted, in which this plane is the best approximation, that means exactly that the gradient of your function is essentially equal to zero, it's very close to, to be equal to zero, right? So think that if I had actually a smooth surface, this procedure of taking the best approximating plane would exactly put you in the system of coordinates on which your graphical and the graph and, and, and the graph has gradient of u equal to zero. Okay. And so what I'm just telling you is that if you make a, 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 a you know, if, if, if you make an ansatz and you actually assume that your current to start with is made by a superposition of nice solution of the minimum surface equation, this procedure that I'm using should capture in each point the second. Well, the first, because I'm tilting the, the plane correctly, and then the second and third order Taylor expansion of what, your, what is your actual function over there, right? And that is the reason why you're getting C3 alpha estimates. Okay, so that is, that is the reason. So if I had in the Taylor expansion of the area functional, the third order term over here, I couldn't hope to go better than C2. I mean, I would have to, I would have to do something different, okay? Very well. So now, once you've done once you've done uh, this procedure, you have actually your average. You have your center manifold, and that is the, the 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 system of coordinates over which you will approximate your current with harmonic multivariate functions. And now you carry on the linear theory. I mean, you can inherit, or, or I mean, you can prove this persistence of singularities. Okay. So from the center manifold. Um, you can um, approximate with an harmonic function um, which inherits the singularities of the captain. Okay, so if, if I want to summarize uh, uh, this approach, essentially, so what, what, what it amounts to is, is, is the following. So there are like, you know, one, uh, like, like, let's say, um, if, if you look at the proof, more or less, there are like four steps. So 
There's one step which is very robust. Okay, which is to invent some multi-valued framework to describe your carbon. And uh, I mean, around point of high multiplicity. So multiplicity be or equal than two. So if the multiplicity is one, then you can approximate with classical graphs. So this is very robust. I mean, like, you know, you can devise, uh, um, um, I mean, you can, you can take somehow our papers and uh, there's a very robust way of doing this, which actually can be modified according to what the problem that you're looking at is. I mean, if it is with coefficient uh, uh, group, I mean, Z with coefficient group G, if you're doing it at the boundary, if you're doing it in the interior, and uh, uh, several uh, other situations. Okay, so this, 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 this seems to work pretty much everywhere. Okay, so then you need a regularity theory for the linear problem. Okay, so this is based on this frequency function. It's very robust, but there are already quite a few places in which, you know, it, 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 I mean, we don't know how to do it. So let's say somewhat robust. So this, man, this may be, I should say, it's very robust. I, I, I don't know of a situation in which it fails, actually. Okay, then there is a third step. And the third step is that I, I mean, I, I would like to be able to efficiently approximate my current when it is sufficiently flat or my geometric object when it is sufficiently flat with multi-valued uh, 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 um, Lipschitz functions. So Lipschitz approximation. Okay, this is a bit more robust than two, but less robust than one. So let us just say this one is robust. But I already would have like, you know, situation in which I know it fails, uh, but I know of situations in which actually this is perfectly okay, but I still don't know the regularity for the linear problem. Okay, and then there is of course the least robust of the situations, the one, I mean, of, 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 the, of the things like, you know, the, the most uh, challenging one, which is like constructing this center manifold. Okay, and this is the least robust. Okay, so let me give you examples of open problems in which, uh, uh, and, and let me tell you quickly what it what fails. Okay, so so um, open questions. Okay, so the most interesting to me. So I can bound. So we can bound the. Uh, a house of measure of the sing or the house of dimension of the singularities with an integer and usually it's the optimal integer which is given by the various singularity examples so let's say with the optimal integer Okay, and the question is, can you show a rectifiability instead of only showing that it's the correct dimension? Okay, and well, one and three are not a problem in this case. Two is actually not a problem. So we can prove that the singularities of the linear theory are rectifiable. So one, three, no problem. Two is okay, but much harder. And this is a paper by um, uh, myself, um, Andrea Marchese, Emanuele Spadaro, and Daniele Valtorta. 
And we are using these, um, these techniques actually uh, by Naber and by, by, by introduced by Naber and Valtorta. Uh, but in fact, it is also okay and it has been proved by Krumel and Vikrama Zekera with different methods. But what we don't know how to do is we don't know how to actually use a sufficiently good center manifold to pass it to the nonlinear theory. Okay, so four is missing. Okay, so you can do something though. Something can be done still. For instance, you can do, you can give Minkowski bar. So I'm optimistic that maybe at a certain point we will be able to tackle rectifiability. So, but you can give uh, Minkowski bar. And this is a paper in preparation by a student of mine, Anna. Okay, so that's that's one example in which actually one, two, and three are okay, but four phase. Um, let me give you another example, and this is like this is um, uh, what is called white conjecture. So Brian. In a paper in the 90s, conjecture the following. So if gamma is a real analytic curve, in Rn, OK, let, let us say R2 plus, um, um, OK, uh, let me just say in Rn, for n bigger or equal than four, this is relevant because for n bigger or equal than three is easy, for n equal three is easy. Then the area minimizing current uh, uh, which um, bounds it has finite topology. And since it has finite topology, you can then prove that it has actually a finite number of singularities at the boundary and in the interior. So finitely many singularities at boundary and interior at the same time. Okay, so for this, as usual, we have one and three. We have the linear regularity theory, and it's not easy, but this is a paper with Sihue. But we don't know how to do four. And let me actually uh, uh, let me actually stress. So there is real analyticity here. And it's actually, so even though when I, asked, uh, when I asked Brian, he wasn't sure whether this real analyticity is really needed or not, it's actually needed. So both the fact that there are finitely many singularities and the fact that um, the surface has bounded topology, which for me was more surprising. Uh, so both of these, fail for C infinity curves. So uh, uh, this is a paper by uh, myself, Guido, De Filippis, and Jonas Hirsch. So there exists C infinity uh, uh, curves in R4 which bound Okay, so I should be actually uh, more careful. So here, so they're in R four, but with a with a smooth metric. So I can't do it in the Euclidean metric. So which bound a unique area minimizing current.
with infinite topology. Okay, and by adding um, another name over here, um, so Analisa. So what actually happens is that um, uh, we can also show that there are examples, and these actually they are really in up four with the Euclidean norm, whose set of singularities is infinite. Of course, I told you actually that the singularities are finitely many in the interior. Well, what I really meant is that they are discrete in the interior, so they could accumulate to the boundaries. And, and, and what these examples actually show is that this might happen. So here I should specify with infinitely many singularities accumulating to the boundary. Okay, we can still do something, but what we can do is kind of only with C infinity, unfortunately, what we can do with C infinity uh, is, is, is kind of very far from the conjecture because what we can do in C infinity, we can show that uh, um, uh, the, 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 the current is regular at the boundary on a dense open set in the boundary. So again, the same four names. So, um, the current is regular at the boundary on a dense open subset of the boundary. And it's actually very close to optimal, meaning that if your boundary contains two connected components, you can really see, you can really show examples with a very large singular set. So at least with a singular set, which has the same dimension as the boundary, so one. So maybe this result can be improved uh, to say that uh, the, the one-dimensional measure of the singular set at the boundary is equal to zero. But that's, that's uh, uh, the much, I mean, that's the best you can actually do. So this is almost all. OK, I, I, actually, this theory works uh, in any dimension and co-dimension. Okay, and again, you see what is actually missing is this four, right? Again, so we don't know how to construct the center manifold here. We don't know how to construct the center manifold there, which is not surprising because it's usually the hardest thing. Okay, but now let me give you a final, um, uh, a final example, and this is another interesting problem. So this is a problem which was uh, again proposed by White. Let me call it White's problem. So this was proposed in the uh, 1986 collection of problems in GMT. It's kind of like the, you know, kind of the, um, I wouldn't say the holy grail, but you know, it's a collection of problems which among GMT people is quite well known, which um, is kind of a little bit, a little bit discouraging, meaning that 35 years after pretty much 99% of them are still open. So it's not very encouraging for people working in the in, in, in the subject. Anyway, so um, there's there's um, there's a, a, a beautiful result by Allard that actually tells you the following. So um, in any dimension and co-dimension, so if the boundary of your area minimizing current is smooth, is a smooth surface. Is taken with multiplicity one. And this gamma lies on a boundary of a uniformly convex set. Okay, so the typical example that you have, for instance, say, Take the sphere in four dimensions, so the three sphere, and take a curve on it. So one dimensional curve, 
okay, this didn't end up actually being very regular, but I mean, that's because my hand is trembling. So it, it should really be regular, right? I mean, like, I don't know, C2. Okay. So then T is fully regular. So really just a smooth submanifold with boundary in a neighborhood of gamma. So it kind of, you know, comes out nicely over here. Okay, then it can actually maybe mess up and create a singularity in the interior. Okay, but 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 there is no boundary singularity. So which is really uh, uh, quite remarkable. And the reason why there is no boundary singularity is essentially because there is this convex value. Okay, so. Now here's the question, which has been completely opened up until now. So what happens uh, if your multiplicity is higher than two? So what happens if I actually put a two over here instead of having a one? Or I put a three or a four and whatever. So now you, you have to be rather careful on how you interpret actually uh, uh, regularity at the boundary in this case, because you know, so there exists curve gamma with more than one minimizer. For the multiplicity one situation. So, you might well imagine that if you have a curve gamma with more than one minimizer, this is a good candidate minimizer. So when, when, when you take multiplicity two, right? So this is going to be say one minimizer, let us call it like sigma one. This is going to be another minimizing sigma two. And when you take the boundary of the sum of the two, you actually get two gamma. And you might imagine that this is actually going to be a minimizer and there are examples in which this happens. So of course you can't say that this here uh, is regular in the classical sense, but you can say that it decomposes into two regular surfaces which don't see each other. Okay, so here it is what I, uh, what I can actually prove. So this is uh, not yet online, but uh, uh, it will be uh, uh, soon. So it's a, it's a preprint. So uh, this is a theorem. And this is joined with um, Stefano Nardulli and my uh, PhD student, uh, uh, Simon Steinbrüchel. Okay, so this is the exact picture that can happen. So um, if gamma is one dimensional, which means that the current is two dimensional, Then, no matter um, how large the multiplicity Q is that you put in front of your um, boundary, So in a neighborhood of gamma, um, the, the, mini, the area minimizing current T consists of Q regular surfaces which satisfy this dichotomy pairwise. So either, so either they are non-intersecting, so either they meet only at the boundary. Okay, so the picture that you have in mind is actually the following, so here, is my gamma. And then these two surfaces, they go 
in two different directions, right? So you're just going to see a portion of the surface which goes this way and the portion of the surface which goes this way. So this is going to be sigma one and sigma two. Or of course they can coincide. Okay, so what could happen of course is that you have your this um, sur surface gamma and here you have say sigma one, which is actually equal to sigma two. So they completely collapse and so they give you two copies of a surface of the same surface, which of course gives you multiplicity two at the bottom. Okay, this is all very good, but you see that it is one annoying fact. So this is for one dimensional objects and Allard's theorem is independent of the dimension and co-dimension. So this is true for any dimension and co-dimension. Okay, so what happens actually when we go higher up in the in the dimension? So I don't know what's going on. So in higher dimension, what is actually happening is the following phenomena. So in higher dimension, uh, the steps one and three are robust. The center manifold step is robust too. But we don't know how to do the linear theory. So missing is the regularity part for the linear theory, which is what I highlighted as two. Okay, and and uh, with that, let me uh, stop over here. Uh, thank you for being with me up until. Uh, uh, late in the afternoon of Friday, which uh, is uh, undoubtedly hard, and um, that is the last uh, the last thing that I wanted to tell you. Thank you, Camilo.